Praise the Lord, Saints. Bishop Michael Berenger here with you. I do bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. My prayer for you is that the God of our salvation will keep your mind stayed on him through the power of the resurrected Christ and the Holy Ghost that lives within. I pray that everything that pertaineth unto you will be safe from all hurt, harm, and danger that the Lord will bless your house with holy angels standing all around you for the angel of the Lord encamp round about them that fear him. I pray that even in these times that we're dealing and living in, that we will know that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, um, that we will know that even though we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, we do not have to fear any evil because he is with us. I pray right now that you will recognize and grasp onto the fact that you are the head and not the tail above and not beneath. And we speak in the name of Jesus that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. We speak right now that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Uh, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid. I pray for the leadership of this country right now. Oh God, the president of the United States and his cabinet. I pray for the House of Representatives, the Congress, the Senate, that God, they would, they would bend their knees and bow their head and seek your face in the matters that they are facing. I pray right now for our church family that every need be met because you are able to bless us according to your riches and glory. I pray that if anyone is sick with your stripes, we were healed, that we will grab hold to your word in the times that we're living in and not just be hearers of the word, but let that word saturate our mindset that we might reach unto you, the author and the finisher of our faith, and that our faith may be secure, for faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen, that we may know that with our faith it is impossible for us to please God. And so we thank you today, O oh God. I plead the blood of Jesus over this listening audience, the communion of the Holy Ghost with them, to secure them, to pray in their place. And I pray for the anointing that breaks every yoke. And Lord, as we go into your word, open up our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. We're continuing in this series, If It's Odd, It's God. I believe that this will be the last uh, Sunday morning message I'll bring you on it. But if you will tune in on Tuesday night, we will finish it with the final part of it. I thank God for your prayers. Remember to pray for one another. Pray ye for one another. Uh, call my name out as I call yours out. And may God bless us all. We're living in some difficult times, but I also would encourage you to be in prayer. And I do pray right now in the name of Jesus for the President of the United States, his cabinet. Uh, we pray for the Congress, the Senate, the House of Representatives, and our national government. We pray for our local government that they would bend their knees and bow their head and acknowledge you, O oh God, and ask you to direct their path. In Jesus' name, amen. But today we are dealing with, in our series, uh, for a title I'm going to use, An Odd Storm. It's kind of strange, you know, because there are times when our storms are orchestrated by outside forces. One true way that you can know that you are on the right track is because when you're headed in the right direction, the enemy will try and do everything he can to get to you. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was preaching according to St. John chapter number 10, and the Bible says, if you read the end of that chapter, they had picked up stones to kill him. But he was preaching and people was believing on him. And then when you get to St. John chapter number 11 and verse 1, it says, now a certain man named Lazarus was sick. Now, here's, here, here's the thing about that. 
When the Bible uses now, it is denoting a form of time. In other words, when Jesus was running a revival and the devil sent a message to try and get him to leave, he wouldn't leave. But the fact of the matter is that the devil attacked, and now listen to me, Lazarus, his friend. In other words, when he can't get to you, he will oftentimes attack something you love and create a storm outside of you. And it is in that storm that we know that we are headed in the right direction. I like what Jesus said when the messenger got to him. He said, this sickness is not unto death, uh, you know, but it's for the glory of God and that the son of man might be glorified thereby. And I love how he told the disciples that Lazarus was asleep. And when they didn't understand, he plainly told them that he was dead, but he referred to it as sleep. And even in these difficult times that we are living through, our God is still an awesome God and he knows the way I take. I want to encourage you before we get into this lesson that if you've got these odd storms blowing up in your life, it is time for you to raise your hands and thank God that you are headed in the right direction. Wouldn't say it if I couldn't prove it. In the book of Mark, uh, chapter number four, and in the book of Luke, chapter number eight, they both write about this storm, but each of them give us a detail that I think is oftentimes overlooked. What I love about the Bible is you can read it a thousand times, and on the thousand and first time you read a particular, you will see something that you didn't see before. And it I happen all the time because the Bible is a living book and predicated on where you are, what you will see. And so that's why I encourage people to read the Bible. You don't have to understand everything you read, but as you read it, God will reveal certain things to you based on where you actually are. And I love that about him. So today we're gonna to be reading about this storm. It was an odd storm, and I wanna show you what was so odd about it. I'm gonna take it from the book of St. Mark, uh, chapter number four. And then what I want to do is I'm going to go over to the book of St. Luke, chapter number eight, and show you that the two uh, biblical writers that wrote about it, they give us a strange detail, and both of them give this detail. It's odd, but if you're reading it, you, you wouldn't actually see it until it's time for God to reveal it to you. And I'd read it for years and just never paid any attention to it. But it is an odd fact that brings into fruition the totality of the story. Now, we're going to be in the book of Mark, uh, chapter 4, verse number 35. God bless this word. <laughs> and I'm going to read it in your hearing. And it says this. It says, In the same day when the evening was come, he saith unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. There arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now traditionally we will stop at that verse. Now for those of you who know, just bear with me. But for those of you who don't, when the original writing of the Bible, those, those chapters were not there. They are there so you can find what you're looking for without reading through the whole thing. But the story actually continues in Mark 5 and 1. Now listen to what the story says. And they came over into the other side of the sea, uh, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. 
And no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. And always, now listen carefully, and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stone. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshiped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there were there uh, nine to the mountains, a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and unclean spirit went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place in the sea. Uh, they were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of the coast. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish it in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Now listen carefully. And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and it was nigh unto the sea. Now I know that those two stories seem to stand independent of each other, but I'm here to let you know that they are forever linked together. It is amazing the odd things that are in the life of Christ. It is amazing how when you read the stories, if you will look for it, there's not a story in the Bible about Christ that doesn't have some odd fact about it. I'm telling you that when you look at it, you will see things that you wouldn't normally see if you look through the lenses of an inspection of the Word of God as far as I am looking to see what really happened and how it all ties together. Pray by all means before you read it that God will reveal to you even this. But based on where you are, what you will see, because this Bible is a living book. It's not just a normal book. And the more you grow, the more it grows with you and the more details it will give you as you grow into reading your word by prayer. So let's go back and pick it up. And I want you to know that in the eighth chapter of St. Luke, this same story appears. And you need to read it in the eighth chapter of St. Luke so that you can see that what I'm telling you is accurate. Because Mark and Luke records a detail that is so odd that I don't even know how both of them recorded that detail, but they did. So that is by direction of the Holy Spirit because me and wrote this book as the Holy Spirit gave them unction. Jesus had been preaching all day long and he wants to go to the other side of the lake. He has a reason for wanting to go to the other side of the lake. It appears as though the Bible does not even tell you the reason, but it actually does. It's just so odd that we don't normally see it. And he knew that if I'm going to cross this lake for the reason I'm getting ready to go over here for, that the enemy is going to have a problem with it. He's tired. And so he's going to get on the boat, find himself a pillow and lay down and go to sleep. I like that because what it lets me know is not only do we get tired, 
But when God showed up in the form of Jesus Christ, he too had a moment where he needed sleep. So that tells me he was not only very God, but he was very man. So then we do have a great high priest who can understand our infirmities. Because he was tested at every point like we are yet without sin. But by being tested and going through it and tried, he actually understands how we feel. And it is good to know that that he's on the right hand of God making intercession for us because when you look at all of that together, what it means is, you know, when I'm going through, I have someone that's sitting beside God Almighty, his son, Jesus, and he is saying things on my behalf, making intercession for me because, and then on the earth, the Holy Ghost is making intercession because he knows the will of God for my life. So we got these two powerful entities interceding to God the Father for us. And that is a wonderful thing to know. But he gets on the ship and he, he says something. He said, let us pass over unto the other side. It's as though he knew the storm was coming. He had to have known because of what he said. He said, let us pass over unto the other side. Now, when they get in the storm, the disciples who are expert fishermen, they had navigated a few storms before. But Jesus lays down and goes to sleep and the devil is determined to take the boat under. But how could Jesus sleep in the storm? Because he had already spoken the word that he's going over. When you see a storm coming, you need to speak to it before it get here. It may not stop it from coming, but it sure will carry you through it. And you can rest in the midst of your storm if you have spoken spoken a word and got in touch with God and you know that the storm is coming. Sometimes you can see a storm coming at you and that's the time to speak your way through it. And Jesus gets on the boat, he lays down and he goes to sleep and the disciples are bailing water. Now, even though Jesus said, let us go over to the other side, they're thinking they're going under because they were expert fishermen, as I told you, and they knew if enough water got in the boat that the boat was going down. The whole church was on that boat. These 12 people on this boat eliminating Judas because he was the son of perdition. But these 12 people on this boat, when I say 12, I'm talking about the 11 disciples in Jesus was going to be the birth of the New Testament church. So the enemy is trying to take that boat down and he caught Jesus sleep on the boat. But he's sleep because he's already spoken a word about passing over. And the disciples are bailing in water thinking they are going under. It's amazing that God can be on board your vessel and we worry about things that God has already spoke us through. But as they are bailing water, the, the, the Bible does not call it a storm. It says a great storm of wind. Now when we think about a storm, we think about the rain, we think about the thunder, we think about the lightning, but oh no, this was wind. The water was acting crazy because the wind was acting crazy. The water was visible for them to see. Don't miss that. But the wind was an invisible force. Too often times we do not deal with the cause, but we deal with the symptoms. The symptoms of the wind was the water. And anytime you spend your time dealing with symptoms, listen, if you got a runny nose and you run in a slight fever and you're coughing and you're sneezing, that is symptoms of a probable cold. But the fact of the matter is you can take medicine to ease the symptoms, but by the time that medicine wear off, the symptoms will come back again because the symptoms is not the cause. It is the effect. And Jesus laid down and went to sleep because he had said, let us pass over to the other side. Had the disciples realized the cargo that they had on that boat, they could have sit down and rode that storm out. Because in order for the storm to kill them, it had to first kill Jesus because he was laying down. It had to drown him before it could take them under. And you ain't killing God like that. You can just forget that. But the disciples is bailing water and then finally somebody said, we better wake up Jesus. And when they woke him up, 
And please don't misunderstand me. I think with what we're going through in this pandemic, you know, uh, we better wake some stuff up. We better wake up our faith. We better wake up our praise. We, we, we had better wake up our hope and our trust in God. But at any rate, they wake him up and they ask him a question. Now, he's asleep. And if you've ever been awakened from your sleep with somebody asking you a question, it takes you a second to focus in on what they're saying. And when they wake him up, they use a word. They say, master. Now listen, they wake him up and call him master. When the master had spoke before they got on the boat, let us pass over to the other side. And instead of them walking in that word, they woke him up. I'm so glad that I can wake God up when things get stupid for me and I've forgotten what he said. And if you think that you would have been on that boat and been cool with water coming in the boat and sit down and said, well, Jesus already took care of that. Oh no, because when you look around and water, when you're on water like that, you're not in a conducive environment for a human being because you don't have gills. And the fact of the matter is they knew if we go down out here, we are done. And they wake him up with the word master. They ask him and, 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 and when they wake him, somebody says to him, master, carest thou not that we perish? Interpretation. Master, don't you care that we're about to die out here? You better wake up and do something now. I give them credit for this. They knew if they woke him up, that he was gonna take care of the situation. And I can see in my mind's eye, yes, it is a stretch. Yes, it is a reach. No, I cannot prove this, but I know, I feel, let me do it that way. When they woke him up, he had to, you ever woke up and you just rub your eyes and try and focus your vision. And, and when they said, master, don't you care that we perish? He may have said, what? What, what, what are you talking about? Look around you, man. We about to go under. Water is in the boat. You all wet. But you know what? He had to be wet because he was laying there. Uh, on a pillow in the hinder part of the boat. But isn't it amazing that the water didn't wake him up? They woke him up. Why didn't it wake him up? Because he'd already took command over it before he got on the boat when he said, let us pass over to the other side. So they wake him up. Now, now, now you got to watch this carefully. And, and they said, Master, carest thou not that we perish? They were worried as fishermen about the water in the boat because they knew if enough water get in the boat, we are going to sink because the weight of the water causes the boat to ride lower and more water is coming in pretty soon. It'll bring the boat even with the water and then with more water coming in, you're going down. And when Jesus, when they woke him up, the Bible says something funny. It says, and he arose. Now listen, that means he got up. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Uh, 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 it takes me to the cross. It looked bad, but he got up. And even in our lives when stuff look bad and it don't look like there's any hope, you can still wake Jesus up. All you got to do is call on him, master. And, and, and he got up. Now watch this. And now listen carefully. He didn't rebuke the water. He rebuked the wind. It is though he looked past the water to see what was causing the water to act like it was acting. And then the Bible says this about it. It says, now listen, listen. When he rebuked the wind, he said to the sea, peace be still. Now, now here's the thing. Peace was always in the water. It was always in it. But when the wind started blowing, it caused the water to react out of its character. And there are times when we'll go through a storm and it will cause us to react out of character. Oh Lord. And, and when we begin to react out of character, we're giving the devil too much power over us. When Jesus got up, he, he dealt, now listen, with the cause of the problem. He looked past the symptoms and there he saw the wind and he rebuked it. In other words, the word that he used means be muzzled. You know, sit down and shut up. That's what it means in Mike Behringer terms. And then he says to the water, 
Peace be still. He only called out of the water what was already in it. There are times when God will call out of us what's already in us because we've allowed the surroundings and wind is invisible. And there are times when invisible forces attack us, take us out of character. We panic. And then by the time we pray, all God is calling out of us is what's already in us. Because he said, peace I give you, not as the world give, give I unto you. But he gives us peace that passes all understanding. So I'm saying that to let you know that when you go through something that is supernatural, it's okay to wake Jesus up. When it gets too hard for you, it's just right for him. It's okay to get down on your knees and say, God, I can't handle this right now. Will you help me? with it. But he called the water to go back to what it was before the wind ever started. There are times when God would take us back to what we had before our storm ever started. Because even though we're in the midst of the storm, he can give you peace when the storm is still raging. That is the idea behind us. Listen, it does not mean that storms won't happen, but I have to find a place of peace in the midst of my storm. Because if I don't learn how to navigate through my storms, I can't go to the next level because when you get to a different level, you deal with a different devil. And there's a scripture that says, now listen now, if, if, if you can't contend with the footmen, how are you going to run with the horses? Man, God is trying to get us ready for something bigger, something better, something better, something greater. Because once we learn how to navigate through these small things, because he had spoke the word, he said, let us pass over to the other side. And they are passing over. The enemy is trying to kill them. They wake Jesus up and he says, he says, uh, he, he rebukes the wind and he speaks to the sea and say, peace be still. Now, what I like about it, it says, and the wind ceased and there was, it doesn't say a calm, it says a great calm. Because when you've come through a great storm, immediately following that you will normally find a great calm because you need that calm time to reflect back on what you came through and how good God has been. Because in the midst of the storm, there is an educational level that you must get in order to navigate your next storm. And in order to navigate the next storm, you must be educated in the current storm because God knows that a greater storm is coming later because he's rising you up through the ranks to be what he wants you to be. Somebody, anybody, just say amen man right where you are. Now, I want you to watch what happened. Now, once he took care of the problem, he turns to them because the fact of the matter is the problem they should have taken care of, they didn't take care of. So before he can talk to them and get them to see what he's trying to say, he has to take care of the environment around them. Not that the environment was going to destroy them at all, but they couldn't have possibly heard him as long as water was coming in the boat. There are times when God would take care of the environment around us because we could not possibly hear him in the way that we are in the midst of the storm. Now, I want you to listen carefully to what he said. And he arose and rebuked the wind. That's Mark 539. And said unto the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Now, in Mark 540, what he says doesn't happen while the storm is raging. It happens when everything is calm. And it's important to note that when things are calm, God will talk to us about what we just came through and what we need to do the next time we get there. Now watch what he said to him. And he said unto them, why, listen carefully, are ye so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Now, he asked them a question, why are you so afraid? How is it that during this storm, you didn't exercise any faith? In other words, didn't you hear me say, let us pass over to the other side? 
Didn't you know you could apply the word I said before we ever got in the ship and got in the storm and it would have worked right here? You could have said, we're going to pass over to the other side and spoke out at the, at the raging of the wind and told the wind, we're going over regardless of how hard you blow. And they didn't think about none of that. They were thinking about survival. And when your mind is on survival, you will often miss your revival. And it is odd to me that he would say that, but that's not the oddest thing in the story. And so he says to them, he, he, he looks at them and he said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have, now listen, that ye have no faith? And then in verse 41, it gives you a slight detail about the disciples that's odd. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and sea obey him? So their fear increased. It didn't decrease. But the fear that increased is a different type of fear that they had when they thought they were going under. Now their fear is a reverence of God. So there are two types of fears going on here. The first fear was a fear for their life. The next fear is a reverence for what kind of man is this that the wind and the sea obey him? We serve a mighty God. And we serve a God that when storms come up, they will obey him. When storms come up, they have to leave you alone if God say leave you alone. So they had a different type of fear, which is better known as a reverence for what God had done. And then it happens. An odd thing happens. Now, I want you to notice chapter 5, verse 1. And they came unto the other side of the sea in the country of the Gadarenes. You see that. Go back to verse number 35 where we begin the story. And the same day when the evening was come, he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. Now go down to five and one. And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. Go back to verse 35. He told them, let's pass over to the other side. According to five and one, they came to the other side. Just like he said it, they came there. Now, now, now you're going to have to go on down. You're going to have to go on down. And then the story about the madman in a graveyard occurs. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give you that whole story, but a note of interest. This madman became a missionary, the first missionary that Jesus ever appointed. This is the first person in all the Holy Writ that Jesus told in his earthly ministry to go anywhere and tell anybody anything about him. He didn't get him from a seminary. He got him from a cemetery. He didn't get somebody who had a mind and an IQ of an Einstein. He got somebody that was demon possessed and told him now, now, now when Jesus comes and he deals with this situation, it is also interesting to note that when Jesus got off the boat, the disciples stayed right where they were because this was somebody you see on the six o'clock news completely out their trees and Jesus comes over to this side and he runs into this madman. He sets him free. And, and, and this is the only place in Scripture. Now, again, I want to say to you, this is the only place in Scripture where you can find anywhere where Jesus destroyed private property. I know what you're going to say. You're going to say that he cursed the fig tree. And that is true. But the fig tree was found on the side of the road. This was somebody's private property. When he cast the demons out, they went into 2,000 swine who ran in the sea and drowned themselves. Now, here's what's interesting. The nation of Israel was not allowed to have pigs on their soil. So when Jesus allowed them to go into the swine, the swine were there illegally anyway, the same way that the enemy is illegally on the earth. God bless you on that one. But all of a sudden, Jesus has, is sitting here with this man that he has delivered. He sends him as a missionary, as I just told you, back to tell people what good things God had did for him. And then that's when something very odd happened. Now, I want you to fix your Bibles where you can read with me because I'm going to read it from Mark and then I'm going to read it from Luke because they both give the same detail. According to the book of Mark, chapter number four, verse 35, he told them, let us pass over to the other side. 
And then when you get to verse number 21, after he sent the man as a missionary to tell what great things that Jesus had done for him, according to Mark 5, 21, and when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him and he was nigh unto the sea. Now turn over to Luke chapter number eight, the same story occurs. And in verse number 22 in Luke 8, it says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that when he went into a ship with his disciples and he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. You see that. But the same story occurs about the storm. The same story occurs starting in verse 26 about the madman in a, in a cemetery who he, he turned into a missionary. But look at verse 40. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, there it is, the people gladly received him for they were all waiting for him. So he went over to the other side of the lake and after he encounters this man in the graveyard, he goes right back to where he came from. Now turn back to Mark chapter number four because I want you to see this. I want you to get this in your heart. And when you get to Mark, uh, I mean chapter number five, same story about the madman is something in there that I think that you should see. Now, when it talks about this, it says, it says in chapter five, verse one, note that it's right after he rebuked the wind and they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship immediately, there met him one out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs and no man could bind him, no, not with chains because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains and the chains had been plucked asunder by him and the fetters broken in pieces. Neither could any man tame him. Now listen carefully. And always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. Now I know that don't seem like much, but it is an odd fact, but when it's odd, remember, it is God. It is an odd fact that Jesus was in the opposite mountain, oftentimes praying at night. We will find that, and you can read it in Luke, you can read it in Mark, that before he called the disciples, he went up in the mountain and he stayed all night praying. That is odd that Jesus one day decided to get in a boat and go across the lake. Now, if you've never been to Israel, the canyons there, and that's how Jesus could preach to so many people because the canyons is a reverberation of sound. If this man was in the hill on the mountain at night, crying out and Jesus is across that lake on the mountain praying. It is not a wide distance between those two mountains. What do you want to bet that Jesus heard him crying out? It's obvious that when he went to the other side of that lake, he went for one reason. He went to encounter the man in the cemetery. And it's also obvious that the man in the cemetery was one of Satan's greatest billboards because he had over a thousand demons in him. And it is also obvious that when Jesus started across that lake, the devil was not about to let him him go and take his man down that easily. And so when Jesus goes to the other side of the lake, he turns right around and comes back. It gives no indication that they did anything on that side of the lake, but encountered the madman. Now, why is that an odd fact? Because it lets me know that God will go out of his way if I cry out long enough. And we as a church body of believers, you need to know that even though he's in the mountaintops of heaven, if we will lift our voice up, that God will hear those cries. He crossed the lake for only one reason, because he had heard that man crying out in the night hour. He crossed that lake because he knew that somebody was in trouble. He heard his cries and he said, the son of man did not come in to seek and to save that which is already saved, but he came to seek and to save the lost. He did not come uh, to heal the, uh, the, 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 the well, 
don't need a physician. It is the sick. And so Jesus had heard that man crying out. And on this particular day, he made up in his mind, I'm going over and see about him. That's why the storm came. That's why it was so intense because the enemy was trying to stop him before he could get to one of his most prized possessions. If God got to go out of his way, he has to bless you if you cry out long enough. That's why Jesus said, ask and it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door will be open. He didn't put it in that order by accident. Ask starts with an A. Seek starts with an S. Knock starts with a K. A-S-K. Ask. Keep on asking. Keep on asking. Don't allow silence to fool you into thinking it's rejection. Because if you ask God long enough, if you pray long enough, if you just keep on talking to him long enough, he has to come and see about you. It explains everything. Even though Jesus was tired, today is today. Maybe he was in that mountain the night before and heard him. Maybe it had been a week earlier. Maybe he had heard him say, several times, but whatever the reason was, he made up his mind, I'm coming to see about him today. When it's odd, it's God. Isn't it odd that God went out of his way for somebody that he knew had something in him that he didn't know he had himself? I'm not talking about the demons. I'm talking about his ability to win other people to be a, a missionary for God. He didn't look much like a missionary when Jesus got there. He didn't look much like somebody that you would send somewhere to tell anybody anything. But when it's odd, it's God. God takes great painstaking time to reach out to those of us that other people never thought would make it. God takes great painstaking time to make a way out of no way for somebody who can tell the story. Can you imagine when that man showed up in town? Can you imagine how people grabbed their kids and hid when they recognized who he was? Can you imagine how he looked in his face with a bright smile on his face with his hands lifted up praising the living God? I was in the graveyard. I was out of my mind. I was in trouble. And he went out of his way to come and see me. He wasn't already there. He didn't happen up on him. He went seeking that man. I believe that when Jesus got on that boat to pass over to the other side, the only reason why he was going over there is he had heard that man crying out at night. He had heard him in that graveyard screaming and hollering, being tormented by demons, a thousand of them living in him. Him. Don't you know that we serve a God that he is going to come and see about you? Don't you know that he did not save you to lose you? And even in these times that we're going through, you might as well keep on talking to him. Even in these times we're going through, God has something in you that is so valuable to him that he will not allow the enemy to have you. There are people under the sound of my voice that they can testify that had God not shown up when he did, I would have been eternally lost. But it is what we went through that gives us the fuel for where we're going to. It is the things that God rescued us from. It's the things that we can preach to with a passion and know what it feels like. If you've been hooked, you are the best person in the world to preach to somebody who's been hooked on drugs. If you've been an alcoholic, you're the best person in the world to testify to another alcoholic. That's why God sets us up. And according to Romans 13 and 8, we overcame the enemy by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. Let your testimony ring out until demons tremble. Let your testimony ring out until somebody come and say, if God did it for you, he can do it for me. Let them know that he's not a respecter of persons, that he is truly a way making God. Do not run from what God did for you. Do not act as though God didn't have to bring you out of somewhere. He went out of his way to save you. Now go out of your way to testify testify about it. He went out of his way to redeem you. Now go out of your way to win people to him through you. He went out of his way and came through a terrible storm. And are you telling me that you can't go through a little bit of the storm you're going through to prove to the world that we serve a way making God? I believe it is an odd fact that that storm blew up when it did. I believe it is an odd fact 
that Jesus went to the other side of that lake like he did. And as soon as that man was redeemed and sitting there clothed and in his right mind, Jesus sent him as a missionary to testify about him. I believe it is an odd fact that when Jesus got on that boat, he said, let us pass over to the other side. I believe it is an odd fact that the disciples were so fearful. They said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? I believe it is an odd fact that God came to places and rescued you and I out of places that other people died in. I believe it is an odd fact that God went out of his way on Calvary's cross and gave his life, gave his blood that whosoever believe in him should not perish. I believe it is an odd fact that the enemy tried to kill the whole church before the first Sunday morning service. I believe it's an odd fact that we have this virus in the land. I believe it's an odd fact that we're now sheltering in place. I believe it is an odd fact that we're now practicing social distancing. I believe it's an odd fact that you're now home with your children. I believe it is an odd fact that mom and dad got to find ways to entertain them because God is trying to get us to see that there is a better way and we don't have to lose as much as we lose to gain what God has for us to gain. A uh, supernatural storm, perhaps, but I think it was an odd storm. What made it so odd is the destination Jesus went to and he turned right around and came back. So that tells me he went over there to win that one man. You are so important to God that he will go out of his way just to come and see about you. You are so important to God that he will go out of his way and walk through some stuff just to get to you. You are so important to God that he has a job for you to do. He has a calling on your life. He has a reason that he is who he is. He has a way about him. And I want you to know that no matter what you're going through, when you cry out, this man cried out under the auspices of death demons, but he cried out. This man was infested with 1,000 demons, but he cried out. This man cried out, not just in the daytime, but he cried out in the nighttime. That tells me that we men ought to always pray. Never cease praying. Don't give up on your dreams. Keep on praying. Keep on asking. Keep on believing. Keep on praying. Keep on asking. Keep on believing. Keep on praying. Keep on asking. Keep on believing. And eventually, when you can't get to God because that man couldn't have went to the other side because the storm would have killed him because of what he had in him. But on the other side, somebody who was God all by himself, when you couldn't reach him, he reached you. That's why Jesus laid down the royal scepter of heaven, rose up off the, st off the throne, walked the unstained pastures of peace, and he came to get me. When I couldn't reach God, God came near and he reached me. And he's still in the reaching business. A madman in a cemetery became a missionary on call for Almighty God. Can you imagine how his story about Jesus impacted that town? He said, Jesus, please let me go with you. He's got Judas with him. Here is somebody who could have took Judas's place, but Jesus said, no, but I want you to go back. Why did he send him back? Because they asked Jesus to leave those shores because he destroyed their pigs that should never have been on Israeli soil anyway. And they told him to leave. And anytime Jesus is asked to leave, he's going to leave something there that's going to testify that he's got. Oh, yeah, you can say that they took prayers out of schools, but as long as they give a test in school, somebody going to be praying. Oh, yes, you can say all the things that you want to say, but God is never without a witness. You are his witness. And that madman from a cemetery who had become a missionary, that's odd. Went back to that town and testified to the goodness of Jesus. What is your testimony? That he is a way making God. What is your testimony? That I've came through some storms and he made a way out of no way. What is your testimony? 
And so today, I want to encourage you that if it's odd, it's God, but don't let your storm stop you from doing what God sent you to do. If it's odd, it's God. And if your storm is supernatural, then you know that you're headed to a place where God has for you to go. I must do the work of him who sent me while it is day, for the night comes when no man can work. May the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ rest, rule, and abide on each of you, now, henceforth, and forevermore. If it's odd, it's God. Peace. Love you.